here in just a second. India, all right. Samanathan, Samanathan, Danny from Nashville, another Montreal. It's really good attendance. Did you did you invite family, John? Is that what this is? Yeah, it's uh, it's all people that are uh, they're showing up for Thanksgiving too. Excellent. <laughs> you got a big table. John's most popular. You see. Yeah, I'm getting to getting to figure that out. Sydney, Australia. Oh, and I know this person. You know what? All right. Well, let's let's kick this off. Welcome to the new community conversations. This is hosted by the Autodesk community. Our community conversations are are live events designed to allow you to gain expertise connect with leaders and grow your community network. My name is Sean Hurley. I'll be your community host and we're joined by the talented Jacob Small or yeah, and uh, Solomar, I never get it right. And we'll, we have a special guest today, John Pearson. So uh, we'll be discussing all things Dynamo. So let's just, let's just go through the introductions here. Sure. So I, right. I guess I'll kick off. Um, my name's uh, Jacob Small, uh, designated support specialist focusing on generative design and BIM of Autodesk Boston office. Autodesk's Boston office. Uh, been with Autodesk about three and a half years now. Uh, prior to joining, uh, I practiced uh, architecture throughout the uh, North Shore, Massachusetts. Cool. Hello, everyone. My name is Solomon. I'm the Dynamo product manager. So it's my responsibility to, to guide Dynamo as it sort of evolves into the future. Um, I'm the person you can blame for all the things you don't like, but feel free to come at me. Um, I'm a curious human being. I like disc discovering and playing with and exploring everything. Uh, also ex-architect previous and have been here at Autodesk for about two and a half years now. Hey everyone, I'm John Pearson. So I'm a Dynamo user and I work for a BIM consultant called Parallax Team based out of Dallas, Texas. I've uh, been at Parallax for a little over three years, like three and a half years now. I used to work at an architecture firm in Albuquerque uh, doing Revit modeling and things like that. And now I build custom Dynamo workflows for people and software and Revit add-ins and kind of, I, I yell at Saul a lot when I run into things on Dynamo too. So this is uh, true. I'm also bugging him. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, glad to be here and just glad to kind of connect with everyone virtually. Uh, it's, I, I said this on something else recently, connecting so important these days. So thanks for having me on everyone, especially. Thank, thanks for being here, John. And, and I'm lying on my bio there. I'm not in Portland again today. I'm in 104 degree weather, Walla Walla, Washington. Later on today, Bend, Oregon. So I'm still being a nomad. All right, before we begin, next slide, please. Some ground rules, there are rules. Lines are muted to reduce the background noise. We invite you to turn on your camera, kind of a foster that we're all kind of in the same room, although we're not. If you have a question, raise your hand using the little, the little hands down at the bottom. Um, uh, I, I think that we'll be flexible enough as normal uh, to be able to take questions if you have them in chat or if you raise your hand, or if you have something really detailed, uh, John, John, uh, Jacob and Saul will be able to address those at the end before we close. The session is recorded. A link to the recorded session will be emailed to all registrants and uploaded to the community conversation site and on YouTube so that you can share it with everybody. Hopefully you'll bring more people to these, these awesome sessions. They're, they're a wealth of, of great learning. Next slide, or did I think you're a little bit uh, leggy, Sean? Oh, uh, my computer's calling me unstable. Uh, anyway, safe harbor statement is is something that our lawyers require us to do. Um, yeah, stable. Um, but anyway, anything that we say in here, if we talk about future features, ideas, things for that are forward looking. Don't make any purchase decisions based on those. Do it only based on the currently shipping product. So that's that's uh, 
that kind of just level sets where we are in the product that we can't make any promises. So our community conversations are expert speakers, knowledge sharing and new con uh, connections. It's hosted by our community managers, like Chris Benner of Design and Manufacturing, Wendy and AEC and Kimberly, who just did one uh, about an hour ago with, with Danya. So these are an awesome series if you have people that are of other, other interests. Let's kick this off. All right, thank you, Sean. Much appreciated for the, the nice introduction. You can, you can go back to being muted now and let your computer do its thing. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to Dynamo Office Hours. So this is a continuation of a series that Jacob and I have been running now for maybe this is the 11th session in it called Dynamo Graph Annotations. Uh, you can find all the previous content. Uh, there's a link, thanks Kate, in the chat uh, here. And uh, please do move on now, Jacob. Um, we are gonna talk today uh, with a special guest. So John has already introduced himself. Thank you for coming, John, and thank to talk about your really cool extension to Dynamo that does really awesome annotation things. So we're gonna talk, first of all, Jacob and I, about the out-of-the-box annotation capacity of Dynamo. Uh, we're gonna do maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then John's gonna take over and talk about how he's extended that stuff, uh, because Dynamo allows for anybody, really, to, to pick up uh, a couple of different skill sets and then learn how to extend Dynamo yourselves. And then we can do a bit of a live demonstration, mostly run by John, and then a big Q&A session at the end. So if you have any burning questions throughout the series, please do ask in the chat. I will try to either answer them on the fly via either, you know, talking or text, or we can save them to the end and, and have a really good thorough conversation. Cool. So the first thing that we have to ask yourself in terms of documentation is why do we actually want to do this, right? And this is probably the, the hardest initial question, right? You're gonna have to spend some time doing this extra work. Why do we wanna do this extra work? Um, and the reason for this is because without that documentation, your graph often will become this large sort of jumbled mess that you can't really wrap your head around easily. You're not gonna be able to maintain it easily as much. So it's really sort of a tool to help your future self remember what your past self was really thinking when you put this piece together. Uh, it'll also help others understand sort of your graphs reason for, for being, right? Like why, why did you put this together in the way, the way that you did? What was sort of the thought process behind the logic routine that you built, uh, built up through? Uh, as well as sort of give you a, kind of a quick sort of what's the spirit for uh, what we were trying to achieve here, right? right like uh, tie stuff together in terms of you know where we are where we want to be um the key piece here is you want to try and explain as much of that nuance uh and sort of the reasoning of your logic as possible and do it kind of as swiftly as as you can yeah and to add a little thing here that the reason for documentation the reason why it's really important is like yes it's a little bit of extra work at the front end but it's going to save you hours and hours and hours of frustration down the line. So if you get into a good habit of documenting, then you're gonna be in a good place when you're building multiple graphs and coming back to them at a future state and trying to reason with your past self as to why you did certain things. Yep. So now that we understand why we wanna document, where exactly should our documentation live? Um, and basically the my, logic around this is anytime I've made a choice, anytime I've sort of branched off where um, somebody reading, looking at a dynamo graph for the first time isn't just going to be able to look at that node and know what's going on, uh, we should describe what's going on. So any choice that we've made, put a node on there, put stuff in a group, uh, describe what's happening inside that group, uh, so on and so forth. Um, also, it's really important to understand that the way that you name your graph absolutely matters. Uh, to, to the notes here, my cool graph 124.dyn means nothing to anybody, right? We should be able to sort of get a clear understanding of what stuff means. I often, you know, get reached out to customers like, what's your graph naming standard? We're thinking of, you know, 15 different letters that will build up this big prefix of things uh, so that people will know kind of what they're browsing through. That gets really, really complex. And if we can't sort of quickly get to where you want to be, um, it can really sort of delay people getting to the graph that they're after. Uh, it also really helps out uh, when you're doing your annotations to set up a consistent uh, color uh, for your groups, uh, be it sort of your own personal use, uh, if you're sort of acting as more of a sole partic 
practitioner, or maybe you've gone rogue in the larger firm, uh, or even better yet, firm-wide or even industry-wide. Uh, this will just sort of help people uh, sort of quickly view the graph and say, okay, it's red, that means there's the inputs, or it's blue, that means there's my outputs, or whatever those choices may be. Uh, quite simply stated, you cannot over annotate a graph. You can't sort of put too much stuff in here. Every sort of keystroke you put in, in terms of that logic, is going to define what it was that you were actually thinking. And there's a lot that goes into that thought process as you're building up the graph. Um, so I, I've yet to open up a graph and say there's too much annotation here. I can't actually use the graph anymore. I open probably a couple dozen different graphs a day, even ones I've made on my own that are the opposite direction where there's just not enough. And that covers it, Jacob. Nothing. All right. I, I figured I'd wait to see if you had anything else you wanted to add. Um, so how do we actually, now that we understand where to document and why to document, um, how do we want to actually do our documentation? Um, and the answer to that is to use all the different cool out-of-the-box features, as well as um, some of the cool extension, uh, view extensions stuff that uh, John's going to show off here in a few minutes. Um, also of note, uh, from Sol can probably speak a little bit more to this than I can, uh, the Dynamo team is actively developing sort of the annotation experience. Um, so you want to keep an active eye on the GitHub and places like that where you'll start to see some of those breadcrumbs uh, get dropped off so that you know uh, what's coming down the pipe. Yeah, so to add to the last point, a little bit of a sneak peek. Uh, we're actively working on a bit of a visual reference project for Dynamo right now, where we're trying to sort of improve the overall experience of Dynamo, but a huge part of that is really the graph annotation experience too. So we expect to see in the future an improved way to annotate your graph, including sort of the ability to have nested groups and collapsible groups and some other really cool stuff. So I uh, watch this space closely. Uh, things are going to start dropping over the course of the next few weeks. Uh, if you're following GitHub, like uh, Jacob said, if you, if you can read GitHub, sometimes it's a little bit of a different language, but you'll be able to see some cool stuff coming up. All right, so now we're going to jump into some specific features. So renaming nodes is actually John's favorite feature that we've released in Dynamo ever. Uh, he talks to me about it all the time. He raves about it. He thinks it's the best thing since sliced bread. Um, but what, the, what, this, <laughs> what, what, this, what this allows you to do really is uh, tell somebody that you've renamed content. So historically, Dynamo allowed you to rename nodes, but had no breadcrumbs as to what that was. Uh, so there's been two additions uh, recently, uh, which is one, adding this little renamed tag, which means that very quickly you can understand what is renamed and what is not renamed, even when you zoom out uh, to a reasonable zoom level. And then also this original node name, which is in the hover description as well, which tells you what uh, the original node name was. And so I think those breadcrumbs enable you as a user to understand if somebody else has made a change to, to then say, if I'm following this image from say the Dynamo forums and it has renamed in it, then I can't actually search for and find that node inside of my Dynamo space. So it's particularly useful for new users who are starting to understand the, the notions of what Dynamo is, and also particularly useful for generative workflows when you want these inputs or outputs to actually surface themselves in things such as Dynamo Player or the generative experience. I know, Jacob, you have a thought on that one. Yeah, I do tend to limit my renaming of nodes to just my particular inputs and outputs. So watch nodes that are going to be output surfaced in generative design or through Dynamo Player and input nodes where users are going to have to make a selection either in generative design where the selections are sort of explored for you or Dynamo Player where you're going to have to do it yourself. Reason being is when we do a graph export, right? Uh, sorry, an image uh, export of the graphs canvas, uh, if I have to ever rebuild that graph off an image and I go looking for a not a point dot by coordinates node, I'm never going to find that in my library. Uh, so it can be really, really difficult. Typically, I will uh, instead recommend, you know, put a note in there if you want to sort of describe a little bit more of what's going on, uh, put stuff in a group to sort of put that collection of logic. But this is something that you can use, just try not to become too over-reliant. I've seen too many graphs over the years where not a single uh, graph name actually corresponds to what the node was. And when we're trying to replace a custom node or something like that, it can be a little bit difficult. Yeah, and one other thing to add, I've also renamed nodes that are really 
really don't make sense to the user you're trying to give the graph to as well. So like it could be a case where you really want to rename something that could actually add more confusion by not being renamed. So typically you'd want to default to using note or a group like Jacob said, which we can touch upon later, but there might be an instance where an out of the box name is just too difficult or too heavily technically jargoned for it to make sense for the end user that it's, a, it's sort of a good candidate for rename. Cool. So another really awesome thing that I really enjoy and I've recently found out that a lot of people don't know about is some automated tools on how to align things. And I know John's going to talk about a little bit of this in this cool extension later. Um, but for the people out there who are like me, who like really clean, clean graphs or are a little bit OCD when it comes to this, we have a couple of different out of the box features that allow you to make things look nicer and more aligned. Uh, and the thing I really like to use first is this feature called cleanup node layout. So this is accessible under the edit menu uh, or a control L as a keyboard shortcut here. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna take a messy graph and then automatically organize that into a semblance of uh, linearity. So the, the graph in the upper right hand corner is gonna get, after we use control L or the cleanup node layout tool is gonna look like the graph down below, which is just much easier to use. And now note this is not perfect because in my own personal approach, I'd probably take the topology edges and the radius node and drag those down so the wires don't cross. But at least it's a really good first pass that gets you to a place of, of a clean graph faster, uh, which is really nice. It also works on not just nodes, but also notes. And when you have them, they're gonna, uh, a note close to a node, it's gonna retain that relationship of them next to each other as well. It also works inside of groups. And so if you select a group and right click, you get the same option and it's only gonna organize things within uh, the graph itself. So really cool stuff. And then Jacob's going to talk about some very unknown sort of uh, funky things that come with Windows, not just Dynamo. Yeah. So um, one of those key pieces in here, if I had a point by coordinates node, and I put a couple number sliders on here, um, we'll copy this down so that we have all three. Uh, the key feature here is that sort of alignment. So Jacob, you've gone on to mute. I went on mute by accident. Sorry about that. Let's uh, let's start that whole piece back over again. Um, okay. All right, so <laughs> I've placed uh, my point by coordinates node, uh, as you can see right there, um, and then these three uh, sort of uh, number sliders, and they're not at all aligned right now. So we can align any selection of nodes, but uh, I've got Monocle installed, so you're seeing some of that now. Uh, but by selecting those pieces, right-clicking uh, on our workspace background and then say align selection, and then we can choose left, right, average, X average, Y average, right? So in this case, we'll choose R. I'm just gonna undo that once. The other way you can do this quickly uh, while keeping your hand kind of on the keyboard is I'm gonna type, uh, just tap the Alt key on my uh, keyboard. And notice when I do that, I get this little underline that happens up there in the menu. So we'll do that one more time. With the selection of nodes, I tap the Alt key. I get the underline in my file menu. And then if I type the E key, it expands out the edit menu. And then if I type the A key, E A, and then if I hit R, aligns everything to the right. So a lot of times when you see me, me building graphs, you'll actually just see this happening. Uh, and that's by just keeping my fingers on home row. I can, with my thumb, hit Alt and then hit E A R, or uh, if I wanted to align two pieces to the top, E A T, uh, or two pieces to the bottom, E A B, uh, or the left E A L. Uh, so you can do a lot of that cleanup as you go very quickly uh, once you learn some of those uh, sort of Windows-based keyboard shortcuts. All right, so the next piece to go over with uh, documentation is notes, right? Notes are really where we explain our logic. Um, you're going to want to put notes on the canvas to sort of break out what it is that you're actually after, right? Try and be, I tip typically keep my notes a little bit more verbose, right? Uh, so you can see here, you know, creating a, va uh, a value list for our color range node that chooses a, each point along the color spectrum to pull a color ranging from zero, the start to one, uh, the end of the range, right? Uh, so very, very descriptive. This is where you can really start to truly break down what that actual uh, logic is. Uh, you can create your notes by hitting Control W and it will start to automatically create those notes. Uh, once you're there, uh, double clicking on the note will start whoop, 
the edit process uh, and then you'll pop up this little window here and then type out what it is that you may want. These do work really well with the node uh, logic layout tools as well as the alignment tools, uh, or sorry, the node cleanup node layout logic tools as well as the alignment tools. Cool. And one other thing to, to add is like we originally, you couldn't actually expand that right note here dialog box, but you can. So if you've been a long term Dynamo user, you can now just drag the extents of that and you can actually write uh, with a, a bigger space to do so and actually see everything we're trying to type in there. And also the, the note's going to populate the center of your screen whenever you use the control W or the create note tool too. So if you if you place it and you can't quite find it, just have a quick look at the center. Next up, we've got groups. Uh, what groups are is they're going to allow you to take a collection of nodes and just sort of gather them together, right? Uh, so in this particular case, we've taken a collection of nodes uh, down here at the bottom. Uh, and then once we've done that, group them all together. Uh, it puts them in that nice colored box. You can change your colors. You get 16 colors to choose from. Again, it really helps to sort of have that standard that describes, you know, anything that's red is going to be our inputs. Anything that's blue is going to be our outputs. Anything that's green is going to be sort of check data or standard calculations, whatever it may be, um, and put that together so that people understand that, uh, document it somewhere, maybe in Dynamo, maybe not. Uh, once you've done that, uh, we also want to sort of add a little bit of context and clarity about, around what happens within that group, right? Uh, so we can go through and sort of describe up by uh, double clicking to edit the group title and then spell out what's actually happening in here. Um, I often wind up sharing uh, graphs on the Dynamo BIM form that have uh, sort of these well-organized groups where we spell out all of what's actually uh, sort of happening in terms of the logic, not necessarily saying what this individual node does, but what this collection of nodes is intended to accomplish. Um, the other thing that's really key about groups is it is possible to change the text size uh, by uh, right-clicking on the group and then you can choose the font size there as well. I believe the default size might be 36, uh, can't, can't recall offhand, uh, but if you ever feel like the font size is a little bit too big uh, for what it is that you're trying to say and the group's just getting sort of out of control with this really descriptive note uh, or you know it's too small and you can't see it based on the scale that you wanna be, you can always change that size there. Cool, now one other quick thing to add is you can add things to groups as well, which is nice uh, if you forgot to put something there in the first place. And you can also use the cleanup uh, node layout tool as well. So you notice on the, the upper image, if there's the right click context menu of Dynamo's groups, which enable you to choose the color and the font size and a bunch of things. And that cleanup node layout tool also shows up there, which will do that inside of the group only and not for your, the entirety of your graph. Yep. Oh, and adding to the group, you wanna select the group first, then select the node, right click on the node. We can't add the group to itself. We're looking to add the node to the group. So that's why the logic is uh, behind right click on the node to add to the group rather than right click on the group to add the node into the thing that we've selected. Cool. So another thing I want to talk about is this notion of a landing zone template. So this is one that I use personally uh, here at Autodesk, and I know there's many different variations of this out there as well. I know John has his own version and various people do. And what it really is, is a place to orientate yourself and any other person coming into the graph as like a first one-stop shop to get as much information as they need to be to you have to find success with the graph really. So I use things like, you know, what is the project this is associated with it, with potentially associated files like Revit files or any required packages, who is the author, as a breadcrumb that so people could come and say, hey, so I downloaded this graph and it doesn't work. Can you tell me why? Uh, and come back and sort of fix this, especially useful in the context of a firm when you have some centralized uh, group of people building graphs and a bunch of other users consuming them. Um, it's also a really interesting way to describe the intent or the spirit of what you're trying to achieve with your graph as well as any sort of like known caveats or uh, what versions it's tested against or any other additional comments as well. Um, I also use these three different colors as in my personal choice, which is the sort of like this pinky ready tone as the inputs, uh, the CN tone as the sort of the functional logic or the, the center or the guts of the actual graph, and then the orange is the output. So very quickly when you zoom in and out, you can notice where there's the input zones, there's the output zones, and there's the rest of it, which is just the translation of data. And so your input can translate it into something else before it gets turned into an output. 
It's also a really useful way to link to external data sets and documentation. And so if you actually put a hyperlink inside of a code block, which I don't have an image of, unfortunately, you can get that hyperlink is clickable inside of Dynamo and will take you to that web location. Cool. All right. And so what we also want to talk about is this notion of a thing called doc the documentation browser, which is work we've been doing since 2.6, which is where this first landed. Uh, a Dynamo version 2.6, uh, which you would have, had, would have had access to as the point release of Revit last year, if you're in the Revit ecosystem. And what this means is we're trying to extend the documentation available to you inside of the Dynamo space. And so that first 2.6 release contained the 30 most common error messages uh, surfaced on nodes with this little read more text and the image on the upper right uh, that allowed you to then uh, open the documentation browser, which is on the right-hand sidebar panel, and it had a bunch of different sort of verbose explanations and steps as to the reasons of why those error messages were happening. And so that was the first incarnation of the documentation browser, which is awesome, I think, and should help shed light on some of the most common problems that exist within the Dynamo space. It may or may not be written in a very technical way and not make sense to somebody coming to the space for the first time. And then the documentation browser has subsequently also been used for a bunch of other cool things. So uh, from Dynamo 2.11 onwards, we have the bottom two sort of systems building themselves, which is one, auto-generating the help on the lower right-hand corner, which is all of the additional or extended nodal information. And then also a way for package authors to be able to ship their own custom documentation inside of their packages and have that surface itself inside of Dynamo. So I know John's been playing with this and building some pretty awesome GIFs. Did I say that right, John? I usually say GIFs, but apparently it's, it's all right. Uh, and uh, a way to be able to ship basically image files and textual extended documentation so that if you have a node that's doing some really funky thing that it's really too hard to describe inside of the nodal description or inside of the, you know, the name of the node itself, it's a way for you to basically extend that and make it easier for users to play with. So this is really cool. Um, can't wait for this to drop and ship. Um, as you'll note that if you're in any of the, the hosts that Revit has, so that Dynamo has right now, such as Revit or Civil 3D, uh, this is not quite accessible yet, but in all of the point releases coming out this year, you will get access to Dynamo 2.11 or 2.12, and that means you'll get access to all of this kind of stuff. You got a comment, John? Yeah, I unmuted right when it was too late, huh? No, um, I think this documentation thing, so it's it's a big deal because like for new users, like I can't wait to have like whole workflows within this thing that's like, here's what this node does, here's what it could connect to, et cetera. So like, like kind of like a gaming walkthrough, you know, but for Dynamo nodes could be amazing. So I kind of want to see what we could do with it once it's in Revit as well. It's uh it seems like a little thing, but it's like a big deal. <laughs> so it's kind of cool. It, it is a big thing. And it's also the precursor to us getting the Dynamo dictionary content inside of Dynamo as well. So work is actually underway right now for us to be able to do that, which means every single node out of the box inside of Dynamo core. So uh, in most of Revit will have additional extended documentation. Uh, which means you'll be able to see that node in a little sample graph and get some verbose text as to why that node exists and how to use it. So very excited. What this should really do is lower the barrier to entry inside of Dynamo and make it much easier for users to jump in for the first time and then for extended or advanced users to find nodes that they might not have used before and understand where they fit and how they could be used. All right, next up in our documentation is code blocks. Code blocks are, uh, as we've discussed before, sort of how we uh, expand out the textual language that runs underneath the hood inside of Dynamo uh, to allow us to do sort of more cool stuff by writing real code under, uh, as opposed to sort of only restricting ourselves to uh, manipulating nodes. So um, anything that is an annotation in a code block will get this nice green highlight. Uh, that nice green highlight will be completely ignored when uh, executing the actual design script code. So if at some point you're trying to debug a lot of design script, it helps to just hit that double backslash right at the beginning, uh, which turns that into an actual comment. So two backslashes like you see here at the start of line seven means this line is going to be a comment line and whatever happens after that, has no impact on the execution. If you hit a backslash, then an asterisk like this, that's gonna start a multi-line uh, sort of annotation. Then we can hit as many returns as we might want, type whatever we might like. You could put the entire works of Shakespeare up there if you'd like. I don't know that you'd get much value from that, but you could, uh, and then close that out with another asterisk 
followed by the backslash, such as you see here in line five. Um, code blocks are, or sorry, annotations in code blocks are the only thing that does not require a semicolon to sort of terminate the line, right? So uh, you can see if it's not a annotation, we, we've got that semicolon right there. If it is an annotation, it's wide open on the end, right? And that will continue to be the case in all cases with one exception. And that is if we ever have a multi-line comment that ends the uh, code block, it does have to have that one last uh, semicolon right at the end. Uh, that's the only one I do a ton of uh, annotations of design script because I learned very early on, if I don't do this someday when I have to go back and re-imagine what my logic was uh, to repair whatever may have changed, it gets really, really difficult if we don't have those annotations. So uh, definitely use them uh, at kind of a high level, uh, rely on them heavily if you can. Yeah, so I mean, as, as with uh, the design script code block experience, similar to the Python experience, again, annotation, you can't really over annotate. So this is an expression of how to do so inside of the Python world. So if you're familiar with Python or not familiar with Python, this is the uh, IDE or the, the way to author Python inside of Dynamo on the right hand side in the image. And so inside of the Python experience, uh, all annotation is actually going to get ignored by the Python engine when executing the code for wrong intents and purposes, it doesn't exist. And the default singular line, so akin to what Jacob just showed with the double backslash inside of the code block, is the hashtag inside of Python. So if you use the hashtag inside of Python, this gives you per line annotation. And this will turn that text into this color or this, this light brown color, which means that it's going to be ignored by the, the Python uh, engine. And if you wanted to do multi-line stuff, this is where you would use a triple quotation uh, mark. So in the top, I've just got a single line called filtered element collector, but you could have any number of, of textual lines inside of there. As long as it's bound by these three triple quotation marks, then you'll be able to write anything inside there. And again, this is going to be ignored by the Python engine. Also turns to exactly the same color. So all kind of annotation inside of the Python world is going to be the same color of brown. And the one other thing I want to note as well, and this is akin to code blocks too, is just consciously use empty lines to build structure into your code. It becomes incredibly difficult to read, you know, thousands potentially a lines of code inside of a Python uh, block without having some semblance of structures, the same way as building paragraphs inside of, you know, if you're writing a, a novel or a story or something to present to somebody else, it's important to have that white space and that notion of white space because it makes it much easier to learn. So the, the, Example we have on screen right here has a series of sort of documentation things at the top just to explain like who, who built it, who wrote it, you know, how to access uh, or contact this person, in this case me, uh, then a bunch of import stuff as its own singular block, and then a specific call out to an alias for the documentation browser, and then also a bunch of stuff doing things down the bottom. But there are distinct steps to be able to make sure that a user can quickly go through and say, well, I'm a, I'm a seasoned Python uh, author, therefore I know I can basically ignore the top half of this and I'm just going to get to the, the fun stuff down at the bottom, which is actually doing something. Last but not least, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about not stopping your documentation at your DYN, right? The context that you're going to run these tools in absolutely matters, right? Uh, so a lot of times uh, when I uh, was practicing, I would put together sort of sample data sets, reference files, Word documents, and more uh, that would sort of walk people through how to use a particular graph. Uh, one thing you could do is you could consider adding a GIF, uh, GIF, GIF, whatever you want to call it, uh, or screen recording of the graph in action uh, right there in that same point so people can go back and see what is actually supposed to happen when we uh, run that particular content. Uh, the other thing to uh, keep in mind is uh, it really helps to sort of save your in-process uh, development uh, graphs as well in this same location. Um, the goal with all of this stuff is to sort of reduce the egg hunt of like, okay, I've found the graph, but it's not working, and I'm not sure if it's something related to my project or if it's something related to Dynamo. By putting all that other content together and sort of cementing uh, you know, where things live uh, and collecting them together, it can really help. Uh, one other thing that can 
really help is if you take the time to sort of document that stuff in some kind of a web page where you can start to uh, move stuff back and forth. Uh, John's uh, blog, 60 Second Revit, has some great examples of this uh, where he'll, you know, explain through what that logic was, give you the image of what the graph's supposed to look like when you open it up, as well as provide uh, the option to sort of download and install that content as well. Uh, and with that, we're going to turn it over to John. So I added this because I have to for every presentation. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was curious if you guys would see that. Uh, that's me screwing around, but yeah, I'm fairly animated. So just excuse me if I say anything crazy. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. <laughs> um, I always like to share this. So like in the chat, we asked who all's a new Dynamo user? What's your experience level? And a few people chimed in and we saw some really cool replies. Um, Really quick, I'll hurry through it, but uh, I opened Dynamo for the first time in 2013. All the nodes turned yellow, even more yellow and red, because it was yellow at the time in Dynamo. And I didn't know what I was doing, so I closed it. And I was like, I'm never going to learn how to use this, like, ever. So um, a year later, uh, we were going to AU with my company at the time, and I was like, Dynamo class, Dynamo class. I added all Dynamo classes to my schedule. And uh, specifically, Marcelo Scamaluri's class, he had one that was for beginners. I think it was called For Dummies, Dynamo for Dummies. Uh, I finally clicked and saw the relation with Dynamo and Revit. And from there, it just kind of cascaded into what it is today uh, as well. I haven't updated this in a while. Um, I mean, last year was a bit different. Um, but yeah, I started out as someone who was a Revit user first. Uh, went into building custom nodes and rhythm uh, for Dynamo. That's the custom package I started out as. And then now I build C Sharp uh, tools for Dynamo, which include packages and view extensions as well. So um, if I could do it, anyone can do it. Um, I didn't start out as a coder. I didn't know Python or C Sharp when I first opened Dynamo. And I spend most of my time not even in Revit these days and inside of Visual Studio making C Sharp stuff. So it's kind of funny. Uh, you can skip through this one or move on to the next one, I guess. Uh, so just a real summary of what I'll show. So I'm piggybacking on what Saul and Jacob showed uh, for annotation and things like that. Um, I kind of, over the last few years, have adopted this idea that if we don't make it easy for people to do, they're not going to do it. So annotating your graphs is something you definitely have to work to do. And my goal was to make that as easy as possible for people. So I started making uh, add-ons for Dynamo, which are called view extensions um, in 2018, I think is when I first started making them. Uh, when the Dynamo team did a workshop in London for the UK Dynamo user group, and they shared that on YouTube as well. So that's kind of, uh, Russell specifically is the one who's like, you should make view extensions. And I was like, what the hell is a view extension? You know, so like, uh, that's kind of where it all began. Um, so the screenshots, just in case Dynamo crashes, you can see all the cool stuff beforehand, right? Uh, I don't know if I have another slide. Oh, okay. the live demo. <laughs> so uh, I could probably share my screen. Um, if anyone has questions, throw them in the chat too. Uh, we'll have question time at the end, but if I'm in the middle of something right now and you're like, hey, what about this? Throw it in there and we'll answer them. If we get a little sidetracked, I personally don't mind getting sidetracked actually really like it uh, when people bring something up. Uh, I've given presentations to where most of the presentation is not even what I had prepared, but as long as you have questions and you're learning something, that's what's in, important to me. And as uh, Kate said, you can uh, raise your hand as well if you need to, and we can kind of let you talk, I think, uh, or something. <laughs> cool, so I think I should be able to share a portion of my screen. Cool. We're going to do the whole, can you see my screen thing? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's get this out of my way. Awesome. So I'm just in Revit 22, a pretty normal project. I've been working on this project for a while. Uh, it's almost done. So uh, we're going to use it today. Uh, that's going to keep showing up on my screen, isn't it? That's awesome. Uh, so within Dynamo, um, as Saul and Jacob kind of indicated, we want to create annotations and document our graphs the best we can. Uh, so as a consultant, that's always really important because we ship Dynamo graphs to clients all the time. So I don't want 
a situation to where someone doesn't know what I was doing or I don't know what I was doing in a year when we pick it back up. Uh, so within Dynamo, we'll just start building some stuff. Um, and we'll get into this in a second. Uh, if you right click, you can search for nodes. Uh, nodes are a collection of code for anyone who's new um, that let you access things in Revit, specifically in this case. So what we'll do is we'll just build a few things. We're going to collect some walls. I'm going to search for all elements of category. There it is. And in two nodes, we've collected all of the walls in our Revit project. They have a green element ID on them. So that means it's a real Revit element. Uh, this is probably a review for a lot of people. Uh, but one of the most important parts is if you're a little OCD like me, you would end up coming in and wanting to align these things. So this isn't out of the box, this little ribbon that you're seeing. Uh, that's through Monocle. That's called the in canvas alignment widget. With it off, uh, I always have it on. You would have to go through and do all your cleanup manually, as we've seen before. Uh, that's how we've done it for a very long time. Back on the Dynamo forum, probably four or five years ago, someone had a macro that they shared as well. It's a Windows app that you can assign macros and do all this cool stuff. And it did what uh, Jacob showed, which was like the alt thing and all of that. I used that for a long time uh, before I had view extensions. Uh, so what we can do now, though, is if you install Mon Monocle from the package manager and you have the alignment widget on, it gives you these little contextual um, alignment tools within the, the canvas of Dynamo. Uh, this is really useful because once again, we make it easy for people to clean up their Dynamo graphs so that way they'll actually do it. Uh, within this, we have all those different options and it will follow the nodes around as well. Um, but we also have options to do grouping. So within grouping, we can do that at the same time. So you just hover and you kind of pick all the different colors. Uh, specifically, these colors are defined within the tool uh, for you as well. So kind of going back to that standardization thing, uh, initially when Monocle launched, you weren't able to change those colors. Um, you can change them, but it wouldn't save between sessions. Uh, we had a few feature requests for that for people to add their own colors, so we added it. And one of the old sayings, right, what is it? You send 10 people into a room to make up a standard, they're going to come out with 10 standards, right? Like, uh, so we want to make it as easy for people to adopt what they want to do as possible. Uh, so within Monocle, uh, you go to the Monocle menu, you can go through and define your custom color grouping as well. Uh, so if I wanted to name this background with a Z at the end, um, and I now group that, it will pull that setting for us. Uh, this is also really nice because, <laughs> because if you're in a different language, you can go ahead and do that as well. Um, so I don't know every language in the world um, working on it, uh, but if you need to do that, you can come in and add those things as well. Uh, these settings, uh, one question that comes up is deploying these to a firm as well. Uh, those are, I'll minimize this. Those are actually uh, serialized right within Monocle's extra folder within the package. So they're an XML file. This was another feature request from the community who uses Monocle. If I right click and I'll just edit with Notepad, we'll see that we have these groups within our tool um, indicated. So if you needed to add more, you could as well, or you can deploy this XML file to everyone at your firm. Uh, you can also specify the font size, the color, and the specific text right in the XML file. Uh, Monocle ships with a default one, but you can customize it to your heart's content, right? Um, the font size is kind of a big thing because when the, the Dino team changed the font size to be, we'll hit Control G for group, to be 36, it kind of drove me crazy. So. Um, that was one of the first features I made sure to add to Monocle was 24 for the font size, because that's what it used to be like in Dynamo 1.3. Um, it jumped all of a sudden and I was like, what the heck's going on? So yeah, uh, let's see. Oh, I thought a questions came in, not quite yet. So yeah, if you need to deploy that, you can. Uh, within Monocle, we also ship um, colors for generative design in Revit. 
So if you don't use generative design in Revit yet, uh, go check it out. There's a primer online. The template that you use for those workflows that's included in the primer, we have colors already baked in here for you. Uh, so if you were to rename this monocle settings.xml, you would now match what's out there um, on the primer for generative design in Revit. If you totally mess up your colors, so we'll go to custom color grouping and I'll, you can actually do transparent groups, kind of cool. Uh, we'll do transparent. Um, that's kind of awesome to do. If you mess them up though, uh, you can always right click on this title and it will fix that. So now it's back to the default out of the box monocle ones as well. So a lot of little hidden features in it. Uh, once again, if we uh, make it easy for people to do this, so while you're working, you can just clean up stuff. Uh, people will be more likely to do it. Um, monocle specific thing, so the in canvas alignment thing, it was inspired from another tool. Um, so it's inspired from Grasshopper. They have alignment commands in there. I was in Grasshopper for some reason and I saw this little thing showing up in the canvas and I was like, we need that. <laughs> so uh, we have it now. So it's uh, oftentimes I'll see something that I want and then um, I'll just add it myself. Uh, so one thing that also comes up, so let's see, I'm trying to think. Oh, I wanna talk about, we have till 12 my time, so 15 more minutes. Um, some of the things that we like to do is tell people where packages, where a node came from. So I publish a custom package called Rhythm um, as well. And to fix that, I started doing this little thing. So I would rename my nodes with a prefix that says Rhythm. So even if you don't have it installed, it would say Rhythm in front. That way people knew where it came from. Uh, I added that Dynamo 2.0 or something, uh, Dynamo 2.5 or something like that. The team decided to change all my nodes to always be yellow on me. So uh, Saul hinted at this earlier. I hate this feature. I do not like this yellow error looking message. I do not like it. I've tried to get rid of it with extensions and they did a really good job making this to where I can't change it. So. Uh, I'll get over it. Uh, it's all right. On, but, on that note, John, part of that visual <laughs> refresh project I talked about is, is reimagining that. Quickly. Very cool. Yeah, and like I like the fact that when you hover, this is a big improvement from previous versions of Dynamo. Uh, we do have the original node name in there. That's huge. That's a big deal uh, because knowing that is like a a really big deal when you're rebuilding graphs as well. So it being in the tooltip, I think pretty good. This renamed thing, I would love like a feature to where like you can like toggle original node names or something, and then it like toggles them back and forth. Um, so some of those kind of thoughts as well. But I guess at the end of the day, what we want to do is make sure we take care of the next person in line who gets this graph. So you always need to annotate where things are coming from and things like that. Uh, let's go ahead and mess with this graph some more. So we'll do this all. Live demo, of course. And we'll just take a few walls. So we're going to use a rhythm node for this. So let's see, we'll go to Revit, Elements, and then we'll go to, I think, Post Object. So we're going to get all the interior surfaces of these five walls that I have selected. And one of them is airing out of me, of course, because it's a curtain wall probably, but oh well. And we'll kind of just see that we've done something. Uh, the focus isn't necessarily what we're doing here. Um, what the specific workflow is, it's that we're using custom nodes. So if we were to place a few other custom nodes from packages that you should have installed, I'll just place some clockwork nodes as well. We'll hit control L just to clean up that canvas. Um, I know that these are from rhythm because it has a prefix. I don't really know where these ones are from. So along with annotating your graph, uh, we always encourage users, and we do this at Parallax. If we're using a custom node, we'll come in and we'll actually add a note above every node that we used. And my note's hiding. Wonderful. Hiding under this chat. There we go. We'll go over every node and add clockwork or the nodes that are clockwork, right? So this is kind of our early implementation of the view or the workspace references that's included in Dynamo now. 
Um, we don't go through and add every one of those manually though. So like, if you think that we actually go through and type all those, you're crazy. So what we actually have, and this is the first thing that came in Monocle, was the, um, the package usage doge. So uh, kind of a goofy thing once again, everyone. So AU 2019 in all the labs, everyone had this open. It was like the coolest thing because it's like we're at this conference learning computational things and then everyone had this dog open. It was amazing. It was a dream come true. Uh, what it does do though, is it will auto annotate your uh, custom nodes for you with the package version. That's really important for if you're someone who's a consultant and you're shipping these things off to someone. It's nice to be able to know this is the package that it did work for. Um, so that way people know that it's always nice. Um, I've had complaints about this, the fact that it is a meme or whatever. So everyone freaks out about that. Um, so it was a, it was a feature request <laughs> and it will actually always change. Uh, if you open it, it'll change. It's random, so it's not perfect, but it will change the image. And based on the time of year, it might do different images. So check it out in October and December, just saying, you know, um, yeah. So that's one way to document those nodes within Monocle or within the package usage doge. You can also send your usage to your clipboard. So you click that, I'll place a note and it's hiding behind the chat again. And we'll just hit paste and it gives you those little package uh, documentation tips as well. So kind of piggybacking on what Saul said earlier, at the beginning of your graph, you can have a group with this stuff in it. If you absolutely hate the fact that that meme's showing like crazy, you can always use the boring mode and here's the boring mode. So there's also a keyboard shortcut for that. If you hit control shift P, it'll open that and then you can use it uh, as well. One important thing to note, so let's see, if this is in a group, so what we'll do, we'll add a quick group. That's in a group and we annotate those custom notes, we auto group those notes for you as well. So we're not just gonna dump a bunch of junk in your Dynamo graph um, for you to deal with later. Uh, you can also clear them after the fact. So that's something that's in there. Uh, we always want the users to not regret clicking a button if we can help it. So that's always a, a big deal to us. Uh, you can also change your package prefix, which is also in your settings file. Uh, so yeah, uh, annotating groups. Uh, let's go through another thing. I'm probably gonna run out of time. Alignments, uh, one thing that we don't love about Dynamo is if I go to align and hit right with a group and a node selected, what do you think will happen? That's what happens. All the nodes inside uh, align. That's not necessarily what I wanted. So uh, Monocle will actually align groups. And this is a feature request from Jacob specifically. Uh, so that's where that one came from a few years ago, probably. Um, as of yesterday, you can also align notes. So the notes, ah, this one has the old version, my Revit. Oh, no. Oh, nope, there it is. That one wasn't selected. So now you can align notes to your groups as well. Uh, you can also hit uh, Alt on your keyboard and hold it down and hit up arrow, down arrow, left arrow, right arrow, and you have alignments as well with Monocle. Uh, so that's another one. There's a ton of stuff in here to document your graphs. Um, so do it. <laughs> um, we're trying to make it as easy as we can for you. Uh, you also get a awesome search tool that actually that works nicely. That's what I'll say to be nice. So if we do all elements of category, that's the node that I'll actually see. I won't see whatever the heck these are, for instance. So simple search is in there as well. And then um, other things you get are if you like right click on things sometimes, it'll do stuff that's kind of interesting, like change all your stuff to Comic Sans if you want. So send people screenshots that look like that, just pretty fun uh, as well. And then just to freak everyone out while you're doing a presentation, uh, you use what's called the Konami code within Dynamo. So up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, and do that during presentations as well. So uh, have fun with that. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of features in there. I think we can leave it open for some questions. That way I don't take up the whole last five minutes, I guess. Oh, and then highlight custom nodes. They turn green. You can do monocle 
beta features and highlight them. And now you can see which ones are custom. So a lot of things in there, but yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> if there's any questions, feel free to do the raise hand thing or anything like that. Um, I know it's a lot of information. Someone got the contrary of it. I'm wondering if the keyboard sh shortcuts can be configured as well. I don't like the alt uh, left arrow, right arrow is pretty huge. I didn't know that was there. It would be even better if I could use WAS though, because I've got my hand on the keyboard here. Not there. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I kind of went with the alt because in Dynamo specifically, like when you're inside a code code blocks, it can get funny pretty quickly. <laughs> That's um, true. Yeah, so Alt is like a very like, like I'm making sure I do that. Um, yeah, it's kind of, oh, well, there's also sticky notes. Let's see. So we, we did answer a bunch of different questions, John. Okay. In the in the chat, does anyone have any live questions they want to ask before we round up for the day? If so, please raise your hand. Everybody is scared to get to the mic. We have 15 minutes, like 15 I'll seconds. Come that Someone asked if you can find or highlight specific nodes in your graph. So our search and monocle won't do that. But if you install, install Dynamo Nito from Andreas, he has a search tool that you can type in a node name and it'll go around and find them. Awesome. I think you just blew people's minds, John, what was going on here. People's well, brains pretty... are hurting. So I did a like a Dana de Filippi, she has a YouTube channel and we did a we did a thing on Monocle as well. And like I forget stuff that's in it half the time. So I get really excited and I'm like, oh yeah, they can hit all and do all this crazy stuff and all that. So so yeah, let me stop sharing my screen. All right, so just wanted to touch over before we uh, run out of time here, uh, some of the other uh, community conversations that are up. Uh, these should be up to RSVP uh, on the community conversations uh, site now. On uh, June 17th, we've got uh, sort of how to plan a Dynamo graph. So if I'm you know, requested, hey, I wanna build a graph that does this, how do I start? Uh, spoiler alert, I don't start with Dynamo. Um, so we'll talk about exactly how I go through all that uh, process and some tips that can sort of help to ensure that you get, you know, from where you are to where you want to be. Uh, then on the 1st uh, of July, we're going to get into extending Dynamo, look at some of the different view extensions that are out there, similar to Monocle, some of the ones that are uh, developed by the Dynamo team and others. Uh, and then on the 15th of July, we're going to start to look under the hood and talk about sort of the different file structures that are happening inside Dynamo so that we can sort of uh, prep ourselves to, for some of these more advanced topics on things like element binding and things like that. Excellent, so let's wrap it up. Thank, I wanna thank uh, our special guest, John, and then of course, Jacob and Saul for, for excellent information. And I'm still trying to process what I just learned. Um, I am a total newbie. If you're looking for other ways to connect and engage in the community, we have a few resources for you. Next, please. We have various Autodesk communities. There's the user groups, there's the forums, there's Twitter, you know, the Autodesk group network where there's, there's over 180 user groups that you can connect, build relationships, uh, industry focused communities. That's, there's, there's ones in, in Facebook. Um, and and uh, do follow us at, at Autodesk Community as well as you know Jacob Small, John Pearson, Soul. Um, mine's mine's irrelevant. I just put I just use memes. Anyway, um, next please. And thank you very much for everybody attending. We 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 do really do appreciate that. This is a community, so this is all about you know come in here, grab the mic. 
Um, I know I've, I know John kind of scared everybody from doing that for today, but uh, and maybe it was just the screen roll that kind of blew my mind a little bit. My next uh, little we do it. Yeah. So uh, continue to stay connected in the Autodesk community, and we hope to see you next time. And don't forget, there's other other uh, sessions. In, you know, in addition to these these uh, Dynamo ones. And uh, Kate, can you please post the link? Uh, there's going to be a feedback link. And that, that will get it. emailed so, out actually afterwards. Ah, Sorry. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. Now my notes were wrong. Um, Sorry about that. All right. Well, we hope to see you again next time and spread the word. Thank you. Thanks again, John. Thanks, John, for coming. Thanks, everyone, for joining and, and hanging out with us today. Really appreciate you turning up and feel free to come again next time. Oh, and one last thing, you can continue the discussion in the in the the, record, uh, the page for this session. So there'll be, you know, you can have comments and all that good stuff. Yep, see ya. Thanks everyone, bye.